2004, a uh, Queensland gun collector of uh, extraordinaire decided that he was getting a, a little bit old and the regulations were getting a bit tough. He donated his collection to a museum and we put a hand up and got it. Uh, the guy's name was Ron Hayes and we inherited about 1,540 handguns. <laughs> so. <laughs> They, they range from the uh, absolutely prosaic to the absolutely exotic. There's, there's guns in here of which only six are known in the world. Of the 1,540, some are duplicates because if you found a better one, you'd buy it and keep the old one. So the best are on display here, the other half are in storage. He, he died two years ago. Until then, he used to turn up every six months or so and, and make sure we were looking after his babies. <laughs> One of the rare ones is a, uh, a DWM Luger made in Berlin, but for the Portuguese Navy. Um, it's one of six known in the world. He didn't specialise in military weapons. We have a cased pair of dueling pistols that he <laughs> donated. They're a, a good French maker at the height of his powers, and it's intact. It's never been used, abused, and all their parts and accessories are there. It's almost unique. We know of one other pair that look comparable. We have firearms here that you, you don't readily associate with weapons manufacture. During the war, the, the Australians subcontracted anybody with the, the ability to, to make weapons for them. And we have here a, a copy of a, an Enfield number no. two revolver made by the Howard Cultivator Company. They make garden hose for a creepy <laughs> hose. <laughs> Over in the corner, we've got three brass body flare pistols. Mm -hmm. um, the, the three in the top right hand corner are a Webley, a Woolsey Lee, and a CSR Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> as far as we know, our oldest Australian made firearm. It's a uh, single shot percussion weapon made on the Victorian goldfields by a blacksmith. <laughs> Come on, a lot of people have. have heard of, not many people want to own one, is the Liberator, which was a, an American design from World War II. It was intended to be uh, cheap and cheerful, single shot weapon, take down a German, flog his gun, throw this one away real quick. <laughs> the contract to make them was let to General Motors. They gave it to the Guide Lamp Division because they were pretty skilled in uh, sheet metal stamping. Two sheet metal stampings, bit of steam tubes, pop welded together, and one eighth plate standing breech, fired a 45 ACP bullet. The contract was for one million units. They filled that contract in 11 weeks at a unit cost of $2.38. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Dardic was a, an oddball design from the 1960s. It was a revolver, but the, uh, the rotor didn't have holes drilled through it, it had pie shaped slots cut out of the outside of it. The, uh, the bullet was round but the cartridge was triangular uh, and when it was primed ready to fire the chamber was the, the two sides of the V in the, in the rotor and the top strap of the gun. They made about 1500 of them that weren't a roaring success in the system. A lot, a lot of the guns in here, um, some of them are genuine improvements in technology some of them were some guy's idea of I can make a better gun than those can. And some of them were direct attempts to circumvent patents and copyright. <laughs> I have here one of the few remaining examples of a Calibri, which is the, the world's smallest semi-auto centerfire. It fires a 2.7 millimeter bullet and I'm told that the manual recommends that you don't shoot at anyone wearing a coat because it's going to bounce. <laughs> Police was declared. They had a lot of machines and a lot of skilled labour and nothing to do. Right, and so you're showing us before that they there's a, a range there's of equipment. Yeah, that we'll, we'll so have a look at here. There's some some car looking parts here. How do when they the, come about? When peace was declared, the factory had a lot of machines, a lot of skilled labour and nothing to do and they wanted to attain as much of their capability as possible so they went commercial and 
tendered for everything that was within their heavy engineering capability. So you, you can see uh, conrods and uh, crankshaft. They made pieces for railway rolling stock, plough tines for, for agriculture. They've still retained contracts with the military and there's, there's um, truck towing hooks, towing pendles, but there's other things that have nothing to do with the military. You can see there there's a Telstra badge and that's part of a, a mould for Telstra to make bits. Other items in here are ear tag cutters. They made lopping cutters for the forestry, for, for tree pruning. Mm -hmm. Made golf clubs for Slazenger from 1935 to about 1980. There's a, a lot of items that we don't have more. That they made when there was no demand for guns, just to, to keep busy. I guess that's why it survived and actually had quite a, yeah. quite a history. Had a very good reputation. Mm. They, they weren't always a commercial success. A lot of their, their stuff was made at cost or probably below sometimes. But their quality was unsurpassed. The metrology lab in the 80s and 90s was rated in the top five in the world. Wow. The factory had a very good working relationship with Slazenger. Made golf club heads for the, the sporting company from about 1935 onwards for 50 odd years. The factory developed its own range of spanners. Brand was Zircaloy. If you find anything, Zircaloy was forged and made here in Lithgow. A lot were issued as under army contracts, but I think a fair number walked out the gate in people's pockets as well. So good quality in their pocket. <laughs> End of the war, Australia was pretty much depleted in terms of technology and the, um, the government asked the factory to help budding inventors. The invention was worth developing, the factory was going to help them and Sunbeam was one such, it was having trouble with its Sunbeam Mixmaster. All the development work in the first batch of Sunbeams were made here in the factory before the, the dyes and, and jigs were taken to the Sunbeam factory in, in Sydney. There's a uh, display there of outboard motor shafts <laughs> um, made drill chucks, door openers, spanners. Contracted to Borg Warner to make shafts and gears for gearboxes. We stopped making old gearboxes. When the P76 car lowered was being developed, first engine blocks were machined here at the factory because they had the security and uh, secrecy to, to do it. Wow. Pennock sewing machine was developed here. The, uh, the final product was made in Mr. Pennock's Adelaide factory, but the development work was done here. Having done the development work, the uh, factory wasn't backward in, in uh, using it. There's a, there's a photo in existence of about probably 20 sewing machines, and there's about five different brands on them. They just put a different sticker on them and set them out. <laughs> During the Depression, the, the shearing industry was in trouble. Uh, couldn't afford the important hand pieces. The government gave the factory a hand piece and said, reverse engineer this and market it. The only people that weren't happy were the importers. The, uh, the factory was able to undercut their price and sell about 10,000 hand pieces, basically saved the shearing industry. For a long time, the factory has been making handcuffs, sold under the uh, SAF lock heading used by corrective services and police in every state except Victoria. Uh, when moving pictures went from silent to, uh, to talkies, the, uh, the factory was involved in making the, the conversion parts for, uh, for cinema projectors. Where we are now is, is basically a new exhibit that the Arms Museum is putting together and it's a whole stack of the old machinery that was used uh, that has been brought out uh, from storage and we're actually set up uh, in exhibit sometime soon so uh, this will definitely be worth looking at.
Well, Brian, that's, uh, thank you so much. That was pretty amazing to see. First off, get down and have a look because it's definitely worth the time. We only covered parts of it. You know, we, we looked at, there was, there was about 700 or something hangouts around, and we looked at four or five of them. Yes. Uh, there is so much to see here. Uh, you're open Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And weekends. And weekend as well. Yeah, or seven days a week too. Just a lot of And that's New South Wales School Holidays, or one would yes. assume. Yes. And of course, we're in the gift shop now. Uh, definitely yeah, most, most, most of what's around us is the gift shop. Mm. Uh, this place is, is uh, foreign orders. Okay. Yeah. Um, Bayonets, particularly, got, got adapted to, to all sorts of strange uses, uh, to the point with, that the uh, factory management put out a memo saying that please don't do it, the steel's not good enough, which is totally ridiculous. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> so every corner you turn, there's something else to see at the uh, Lithgow Small Arms Museum. So Brian, really appreciate your time. It's been wonderful, and uh, good luck.